more foolish I feel to think that I can dissect them and figure out what each one is. <laughs> um, to think that I can separate them into tangible parts, but the more I study, the more I see how impossible it is. Certainly we can see some characteristics, some traits that are unique in each of his attributes, but the reality that they are so inseparable is, is a, a tangible thing. Last week we saw the divine union of his love and holiness. You cannot separate the two. Uh, the fact remains God is absolute perfection in love, and that includes absolute perfection in holiness, and he has blended them. I mean, they are blended together in who he is, that though we look at the individual parts, we can't help but see fingers reaching out to the others, and they're, they're connectors all throughout. Today we consider his natural attributes, and I have to confess with a certain amount of fear and trembling. I just don't know where to begin. <laughs> um, how to develop this study or where to go with it. He is so past finding out our, our understanding that to even try to do so serves to show how little we can know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm discouraged about it. I'm just saying that, that the more we get in the Word, the greater and una, more unattainable He is, even understanding who He is. God's natural attributes are the nature of God's being that are unique to Him alone. No one else has ever nor ever can incorporate any of these attributes into their lives, in spite of what Mormonism tries to tell us. You know, Mormons believe that Jesus was once a man who became God, and that we as man can become God as well, as long as we follow Mormon doctrine. Now, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply list each attribute and mention some verses about each one, you might want to jot down some of these references for your own study and meditation. So you might want to get a piece of paper and a pen. If you need either one, let, let me know. Raise your hand, and we'll uh, have someone go get them for you. But I'm going to ask you to help put each attribute in perspective by discussing what each one means to us, how each of these attributes impact us in our lives. Um, the first one, for example, <laughs> God is transcendent, uh, which speaks of the fact that he is above his creation. Not that he's detached, but he is, he is over all. In Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, he he writes, The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, on one hand, it, this is a source of comfort, comfort in that someone's in control of this world that seems to be falling apart, yet he knows exactly what he's doing. Our God is a God who is transcendent. Now, what does that mean to us? When we think about the transcendent God, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, what does that mean to us? Anyone? We're starting off with a tough one, so maybe we'll come back to it. John? John? Good. All right. That's very good, Mike.
Good. There's no constraints. Absolutely. Good. I'd like to build on something that, that John was saying, that it's impossible to get on, on top of God. Uh, he is unattainable. Um, I had a thought, and I'm trying to bring it back. But <laughs> um, but the the idea of the transcendence of God, that he is over all, uh, is not only do, does he get larger, the more we know him, the more we see of him in Scripture, but we get smaller. Um, we begin to fade in importance, the more important he becomes to us. Uh, I think the, the idea of his transcendence, that he is over all, carries the idea that this, he is such a magnificent God that we cannot attain. The next one is God is eminent. Not only is he over all, but at the same time he is actively involved with his creation. God is eminent. Again, the same verse, but a different segment of it. In Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Ephesians 4, 6 says, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Startled me just recently to realize that not only does the Holy Spirit dwell in us, not only is Christ in us the hope of glory, but here we see that God the Father is in us as well. God wants us to understand He's right there with us. He is in us. Now, He is imminent. While he is in the high and lofty place, he is also with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. And he is through all, in all, and in us. Now, how does that impact who we are? How does that impact our lives to know that he is actively involved in his creation, in us particularly? As we think about the eminence of God, he is right here with us. Notice he says, I dwell with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. What does that tell us about God? Is God impressed with our accomplishments? Is God impressed with the force of our personality or intellect or abilities? What is he saying? God is eminent. The reason I'm doing this is I want us to understand not only the, the significance of these doctrines, of these truths about God, but the fact that they are something that is directly related to us today. What do we see of God in that he singles out those that he dwells with as having a contrite and humble spirit and the fact that he is in you. God is an eminent God. God dwells with those who see him so clearly that we become fearful of our own sin. What was Isaiah's response when he saw the manifestation of the Lord? He said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. His, his presence was something that overwhelmed him with the magnitude of his holiness, which we've already considered to a certain extent. And the reality of who he is just causes us to recognize what have I got to think that I'm so hot about <laughs> what is there in me that that comes anywhere close to who he is and it breaks our heart the very idea that we would defend ourselves and not trust God to take care of us the very idea that we worry and we fret when he's already promised he's going to 
take care of us. You see where I'm going with that? The, the, the idea that God is an eminent God, He's right here with us, is something that is very personal. And when we understand who He is, it'll fill us with great humility at that realization. John? Good. Tom? Good. And even in this life, uh, abundant life is related to that too. Yeah, yeah, amen. Stephanie, you have something else? Okay. Notice this is intertwined with his omnipresence. But the thought here, the title, shall we say, is the eminence of God. Very good. Appreciate your comments. Next one, God is eternal. That means he has no beginning or ending. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, uh, we read, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. And then over in Micah 5, 2, and this is one I like to show Jehovah's false witnesses. Uh, because there he says, but thou Bethlehem Ephratah. I mean, clearly in Psalm 90, verse 2, that is speaking of God, the Lord God Jehovah. Well, then you take him over here and you look at Bethlehem Ephratah. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. Now, who came out of Bethlehem? Jesus was born there came forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, he is the Messiah, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Making a clear connection with Jehovah and Jesus Christ. Now this is a, this is a favorite question our kids will ask us. Daddy, where did God come from? <laughs> uh, he has always been. How can that be? That's one of those things we look our kids right in the eye and with all the wisdom that we can muster. Say, duh, I don't know. <laughs> um, the fact remains, that's what he said. He is to be eternal means that he has always been. And that is linked in with his I am. That he is always am. It is always today linked with his om omniscience. But the point is... God is eternal. He has always been. He always will be. All of us, every man, every woman has always had a beginning. Um, but only God comes from everlasting. There is no angel, not Satan himself, not any angel or demon or anybody is eternal. Only God is eternal 
And, of course, Jesus Christ is clearly Jehovah. In fact, I, I, I like to start from those two verses uh, when I speak to Jehovah's false witness. And I, say, and I mention to them, I say, you know, Jesus, or God has a number of names. And I mentioned Jehovah Shalom, the God of all peace, Jehovah Jireh, uh, the God of provision who takes care of us and so forth. And then I say another name for Jehovah is Jesus Christ. And then, then I show them these two verses. Um, and we recognize the fact that every, every character, every attribute that we consider certainly refers to Jesus Christ as well as Holy Spirit. For God is three and one, which is another study in itself. <laughs> All right, now, what does that mean to us? God is eternal. Since he is eternal, that means what in our relationship with him? Certainly it's related to the fact that he never changes his immutability, which we'll consider in a little bit. Uh, they're all intertwined. <laughs> you can't talk about one without referencing the others, Tom. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. Amen. All right. Anyone else? Now, since God is eternal, what does that say to us? That's right. He's always been the same, immutable. He's always been, and thus we recognize that what we see of God from the Bible of the Old Testament days 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, He's still the same. He's still there. He always will be, always has been. He's never been any different. He's just who He is. That gives us absolute confidence that our God is there. Tom? Yeah, amen. Lamar? Amen. That's right. He is the beginning, and he is the ending. <laughs> John? Okay. All right, go, go on with that. Uh, explain it a little bit. Okay, good. Carolyn, was your hand up? Okay. Good. 
Okay. All right, good. One more. God is infinite. Means that all of his attributes are without limit. That includes his moral attributes, his natural attributes. He is altogether God, and he's not just he's not just the perfection of these attributes. He is each one of them. Um, Psalm 103, verse 17, speaking of the mercy of the Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting. He's always he's, he's always been a God of mercy. When he created us, he had a, a people to show mercy to. <laughs> uh, Psalm 147, in verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite, without end. It, his understanding... <laughs> How do you define infinite understanding? <laughs> um, I mean, not only does he understand everything, he understands what could be, what might be, what is, what was, what will be. He is infinite in his understanding. God is an infinite God. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we think we're so smart. We think we can get figure God out. Um, <laughs> the fact remains, we don't think like God thinks. While we learn to humble ourselves before Him and abide in Him and walk with Him and, and, and recognize His truth, there are still things that we, we are so easily, um, so easily led astray from the intangibles of the truth. Um, we can begin thinking a certain way that's just a little bit different than the way God thinks. Takes, and it takes time for Him to bring us back around. Um, his thoughts are not like ours, nor his ways, because both are higher than ours. And then in Jeremiah twenty three twenty four, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? He fills the earth. He is infinite. Our God is an infinite God. But how does, what does that mean to us? Since God is infinite in all of his attributes, that includes his moral attributes, love and holiness. Love, speaking of his mercy, grace, um, the peace that he gives us, the joy. And then his holiness, speaking of righteousness and truth and justice. He is absolutely infinite in all of his attributes. But what does that mean to us? Mary? Absolutely perfect. I mean, there is not a single flaw in God at all. No matter what we go through, no matter how much our hearts may break, no matter how difficult it may be, a long-term illness and pain, no matter what it is, God is always perfect, including in His goodness. Anyone else? God is an infinite God. Stephanie? Stephanie? Oh, good. Yeah, amen. We can depend on his supply <laughs> for everything we need. It's always going to be there. Very good. Lamar? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. God is an infinite God. Tom? Yeah, really.
Amen. Yeah. Boy, that, that's that's convicting for all of us because uh, to recognize there are times, boy, we get <laughs> uh, we get really tight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's just the truth and his his nature. Amen. Amen. Kamar? Yep. Yep. That's right. Yep. Amen. Aaron? You know, that's very true. The infinite truth of his word uh, is something that uh, it's always fresh. Every time you read it, there's, there's something else that God uses it to convict you about or to instruct you. Uh, very good. Very good. John? that amazing? Folks say, man, just sitting on a cloud playing a harp, that's going to be boring. First place, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I'd love to play a harp, yeah. <laughs> but uh, after a couple of thousand years, you know, in our, in our finite minds, we think we would. But I don't care what the Lord has for us. We can be absolutely sure we're going to be rejoicing to the utmost of our ability. I wonder if I'll get to keep bees while I'm in, in heaven. Without stingers. How about that? <laughs> Mike? Good. 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 <laughs> Amen. Do you see my problem? <laughs> Trying to explain the magnitude of who he is. Uh, I've got four other ones, but let, let's stop here. But uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll, we'll pick it up. But we'll look at God as immutable. He's unchanging. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent everywhere at the same time. Omnipotent, all-powerful. I close with this. And I want to ask you to do something a little different. I've, you, I've mentioned this before, but let's do this a different way. I want to ask you to close your eyes. Don't go to sleep. Just close your eyes and listen for just a moment as I just try to describe, draw a word picture for you, what I saw at the planetarium showing uh, at uh, Ken Ham's uh, Creation Museum. Be bear in mind that you're going to be leaning back and looking so that you can look up and the ceiling is rounded. It's, it's concave. And it, the lights go out, and then they have projectors that project pinpoints of light that demonstrate the constellations and the stars. As, as you're looking, he is expl the speaker is explaining what we're seeing, identifying the different constellations from the viewpoint of the earth. And then he points out the nearest star and how many light years away it is. And he said, let's go look at that star. And they have a computer simulation of being in a spaceship approaching that star as it gets larger and larger. And then he talks about the, the largest star, and you go to that one. Then go, go to the edge of the galaxy, and you go there. And then as you get to the edge of the galaxy, you're startled to see thousands of more galaxies. And so you go to the next one, and then on to the edge of the universe, as best man can comprehend it. 
And then the computer simulation turns it around, and you see all these stars in the ceiling. And as it turns around, now let's return back to Earth. And they draw a circle where Earth is located, and you can't even see a speck. And then they show graphically how long it takes in the time frame, the measurement of how, it, how long it would take at the speed of light to get back to Earth. And then as the earth gets larger and larger, but first it's got to appear. And it's a long time before it even appears. Now, as you think about the magnitude of his universe, God simply spoke, and there it was. And in, in that little speck, that can't even be seen by the naked eye. Yet God sees us and knows us, loves us, and invites us to dwell with him. What an amazing God. Father, we thank